So today we are going to discuss some more examples of string handling. More particularly, we will look at the input-output handling of characters. So far we have been using a C++ operator called C in and another called C out for handling input and output. As you know, the C in and C out uses greater greater and less less operators in order to extract individual values which we name in those statements. Now the input that you type in usually have these values separated by one or more blanks. So whenever you give a blank, a value is supposed to have ended and the next value starts. What if you want to read a blank character itself from the input stream? Similarly, whenever you press enter while giving input, the present value of input terminates. What if you want to capture even the enter symbol itself? Because enter also has an ASCII code. How do you generalize the input operation to capture each and every character that is typed at input without bothering whether it is part of an integer number, part of a floating point number, part of a car, whatever. Obviously, such characters can be captured only in a car type variable. So you can declare a car type variable, but the issue is still how do we handle input and output of individual characters. In the process, we shall also reiterate that internally a character is represented by the ASCII code that corresponds to the symbol that has been stored in that car variable. Immediately after this, we will proceed to discuss an important concept in C++ called pointers. These pointers are essentially addresses to memory locations. Ordinarily, we don't deal with addresses. We directly deal with the names, M, N, R, A, A, whatever, whatever. And we refer to any value by the name that we have given to that value. But it is possible to directly refer to addresses in which these values reside and do some arithmetic with these addresses, which provides some interesting possibilities for programming. So we shall look at pointers and pointer arithmetic. Subsequently, we will look at functions again. So far, we have seen that functions are called by transferring actual parameters that you mentioned in the function to the formal parameters defined in the function body. So these actual parameters are actually copied onto the corresponding parameters. That is one way of passing parameters called parameter passing by value. There is another passing mechanism called parameter passing by reference. And we shall see what that reference passing means. We may not be able to cover the later part in this lecture today. We will do that on Friday when we discuss the general concept of files as well. So this is what we have noticed so far, that as far as handling characters are concerned, we can define a char type variable, say x, y, p, c, whatever, and store one character in it. What gets stored actually is an ASCII value. If we have to store a string of characters, then a string of characters can be stored in an array. The convention that C++ follows is, that whenever you have a string of characters stored in an array, you invariably put a backslash zero as the last character in that array. It is an artificial character, it is an artificial symbol. It is not part of your string, obviously. Backslash zero amounts to a null value, which is literally zero. So a, 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 a symbol whose ASCII code is zero. It is not printable, you can't see it, but its ASCII code is zero. So whenever a zero comes at the end of a string, any processing can terminate because you know that the string has ended. We have seen that we can directly read an, uh, a, a character string typed as input in an array of characters. For example, if I declare char str 50, then somewhere in my program, I can say c in c 
सी इन आइडेंटिफाइज एस टी आर एज ए कैरेक्टर आर ए एंड देर फोर इट नोज दैट इट हैज टू गेट अ सीक्वेंस ऑफ कैरेक्टर्स फ्रॉम द इनपुट एंड दोज कैरेक्टर्स आर टू बी पुट इन साइड दिस स्ट्रिंग एश्यूम दैट आई टाइप इन लेट्स ए नेम ऑफ आवर कंट्री इंडिया एंड लेट्स ए आई पुट अ ब्लैंक हेयर एट दी एंड द मोमेंट फर्स्ट ब्लैंक कम्स सी इन विल टर्मिनेट इनपुट बिकॉज दैट इज द कैरेक्टरिस्टिक ऑफ सी इन सी इन रिमेंबर इज सपोज टू आइडेंटिफाई एंड आइसोलेट डिफरेंट वैल्यूज दैट यू टाइप इन एट इनपुट द फर्स्ट ब्लैंक विल टर्मिनेट वॉट विल गो इन टू एस टी आर विल बी आई एन सॉरी दिस विल बी ए स्मॉल एन डी i a and so this will be the contents of str0 this will be the contents of str1 and so on these will be the contents of str4 the fourth element will contain the symbol for a and this will be the content of str5 please note therefore that if you want to store a string in a char array then the length of the actual string stored has to be one less than the size of the array because you require an extra element to store the backslash zero at the end this is how c in works the question that we are raising is what if i want to read these blanks as well suppose these blanks these two blanks at the end or suppose i put a comma somewhere suppose i put an exclamation mark after blanks and i want to say that look i will internally analyze what are the contents of these string whether they contain integer values floating point values or some arbitrary symbols is my business i don't want you to meddle with me i want you to quietly give me all the characters that i type as the input such a function is not provided by c in c in will not work there are two variants which we would like to do for which c++ provides special functions these are called character io functions the first of these reads a character it is invoked by using get char it has no parameters the moment get char is invoked whatever you type on the terminal the character any symbol any key that you type is captured and is given back as the return value that would be assigned to c if you have declared char c as a character variable note that this will read every character this will not only read a blank but this will also read a enter character enter itself has an ascii code the new line character so it will read that usually if you want to read a series of characters using get char you would use this get char function in an iterative loop so you can say while true okay c equal to get char and then do something with that c the problem is how do you terminate this loop that is because anything that you type is a valid input it will be taken in so you will have to have some special arrangement logically set into your program to terminate such an input we may for example say that look the capital x is a symbol which i will never type ordinarily so please look at all the characters that i type in till i type capital x so obviously whenever capital x is typed it will also be read by this function but then i can analyze it in my program and if i find the capital x i may terminate the object capital x is a artificial example that i gave usually you will give a symbol which is ordinarily not expected to appear in your string invariably our actual requirement in practice is to read one full line of characters that is whenever i press enter i say this line is terminated it may not make sense in terms of numerical values where i have to read let's say 1000 values i might arbitrarily type seven values separated by space on first line press and enter eighth line tenth on second line and so on that is permissible but when i am handling text information take for example roll number of a student 
which incidentally in IIT is a string and not an integer number because capital D is there sometimes and so on. Name of a student, which could be first name, middle name, last name, etc., etc. Batch number of a student, marks of a student. And as I said, when I have to input a large value set, I will not be typing it physically. I will be preparing that input in a file and I will be reading from that file directly. How will I prepare a file? Invariably, I will prepare a file such that one line of text corresponds to one student. Next line of text corresponds to second student. That is natural. So roll number, name, marks, let's say. Enter, roll number, name, marks, enter. This is one example where I want to read the entire string till enter is typed by someone. Then I want to read the next line till enter is typed. And I want to retain this entire string in an array inside. I will then take the responsibility of analyzing what are the contents of this array, which is roll number, which is name, etc., etc., that I will analyze. For such a situation, you have a function called get string or get s. This is an old deprecated function. So modern C++ compilers, either some of them may not support this or some will say it is dangerous to use this. Let us see what is the danger here. The objective of this function is actually to read all characters typed as input till you encounter an enter symbol. The moment an enter is pressed, the enter is actually read inside by the operating system, but get s will sense that enter, terminate the input operation, and instead of enter, insert a backslash zero in the array that you name. So consequently, what we saw in the previous slide, say I type India, I will actually, when I execute get s a, I will get India followed by backslash zero assigned to it. Let us see some examples of how do we handle this, how do we use this. So these are some example problems. First problem says, read all characters till I type capital X. The moment I type capital X, I, I should terminate the input operation. Now I want to store all these characters which I have read in an array. And finally I want to print the ASCII value of every character that is stored in that array. Simple problem. The next problem says the same thing, but it says read a string using get s and do exactly the same operation as earlier, except that there may not be any artificial capital X typed in. When I read a string, okay, the moment I type carriage return or enter, the string will terminate. So I have to do the same thing. The third and fourth problem are more interesting. I have read a string. Now, I am told that this string contains a full name of a person. Usually it is first name and last name. And these names, these two parts could be separated by one or more blanks. Now my job is that I read such a string, I have to isolate first part and I have to isolate the second part. And I have to assemble them in two different strings. That is one problem. The second problem is more general. It says I have typed some words on a line. How are you? With some blanks in between. If there is exactly one blank between every word, then it is relatively easy. I can read all the array, uh, 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 I can read the entire string in an array, and I can simply start scanning the array element from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The moment I get a blank, I know one word has ended, I will put a backslash 0 in that word, start a new string for the second word, and carry on like that. But suppose I have variable number of blanks. Suppose somebody says that I may put any number of blanks in between. Worse still, the last word when I type, I do not press enter immediately. I press some blanks also. Still worse, the first word which I type does not begin immediately with the first character I type. I say blank, 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 how? Blank, R. Blank, 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 U. Blank, 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 enter. Now that is a more interesting problem. How do you extract these different words after having read a string? So the handout that I have given contains some of the programs that we'll discuss. Please pay attention to the discussion here. You can read these contents later. Whenever I wish you to refer to the page, I will mention that. We'll look at some of these problems. Here is a program which reads individual characters typed by the user. So look at 
what the program declares it declares a character variable c it declares a character array 256 we are assuming that you will input maximum 256 characters please note that in this particular problem we are not assembling a valid string and therefore it is not necessary to put a backslash zero symbol we are merely storing the characters individual characters as a dumping bin the array is being used as a dumping bin that's all we are never going to treat that entire array as a single string and therefore we can accommodate all 256 characters in the first place there is no need for a backslash zero because the problem says whatever is type should be stored and at the end you should finish off giving me the ascii values of these characters ncar is used to represent number of characters so i set it to zero cval is the ascii code for a particular character c that i will read or i will analyze this is the program so let's see what i do in this program i start with reading a character whatever i type get care will get me that please note that i need to check that capital x has been typed or not if capital x has typed i have to quit so i set up a while loop while c is not equal to capital x ordinarily that would be sufficient but since I intend to put this character in an array element, then I must ensure that array does not get filled up and beyond the capacity I don't try to push anything in it. Therefore, since n carries the number of characters that I will maintain at any point in time, that number should be less than 256 because the array has uh, indexes from 0 to 255. Note what I am doing. Whatever character I have read, I am actually its ASCII value to A n cap. Remember A was int. A is not character. Let's go back. Int A256. So I'm not going to store characters in this array. I'm going to store only the ASCII values of the character. As you know, C appears in dual representation internal. C is actually a number. We normally treat it as an unsigned integer so that it can represent all ASCII values. But whenever I assign it to an integer value or whenever I use it in an expression, its intrinsic integer value is used, which is the ASCII code. So this will capture the ASCII code here. Immediately thereafter, I increment ncar to keep myself ready to capture the next character in that array. And I read the next character. So as is standard in any while loop, I set up first character and then I keep reading these characters. Remember, after C equal to get care, I will be thrown back to this while loop. And if the last character read happens to be capital X, I will get out. On the other hand, whatever be the last character read, if n care has already reached 256, that means 0 to 255 elements are filled up, I have no more space, I will come out here. In any case, n care will represent the current number of characters read, whether up to 256, that is 0 to 255 or what? So I will set up a simple for iteration i equal to 0 to n car minus 1 and I will output a i. This output is, is a valid integer output because a is an integer. I. So I will print the ith element. Is that clear? This is a very straightforward uh, program. I, I put end of line at the end after printing all the characters. This will be the program output. So suppose I type symbol 1, 2, 3, 4 on one line, press enter, say 5, 6, 7, another enter. 8, 9, enter, 0, enter, x, enter. Get care will start capturing these values. What is the ASCII code for 1? 49. What is the ASCII code for a blank? 32. What is the ASCII code for 2? 50. ASCII code for 3 is 51. ASCII code for 4 is 52. Notice that what I am getting printed is 49, 32, 50, 32, 51, 32. These are all blanks. 32 is the ASCII value for blank. But after 52, I get a 10. What could this 10 be? Enter. Because after 4, I have an enter symbol. I don't have a blank symbol. Note that if after 4, I had typed one blank and then pressed an enter, there would have been 32 before this 10. So although something is not visible to us, when we capture internally, that value will be captured. So this is how it will continue to print. The last one, is 48 enter 
48 is the value for 0. Okay. After that, I have typed capital X. But notice my program terminated the moment it took capital X and therefore capital X is not printed. Is this understood? Can I make this program simpler? Yes, I can. So this is another version. In this version, I have the same declarations. I start with the same thing as ncar equal to 0. But I don't read any character to kickstart my while loop. So notice the way the while loop is written. It's a very interesting implementation. It's a shorter implementation and more elegant implementation. Look at what I'm doing. While a ncar plus plus equal to get care, all that not equal to capital X and ncar less than 256. Where is the body for while? There is no body. I put a semicolon. So what is it repeating? It is repeating itself till the condition is satisfied. Now we have said that in any while loop, the body must change the condition. Otherwise the condition will remain perpetually valid or immediately invalid. But notice what we are doing here. First of all, let us analyze this assignment statement. This gets a character, get care. So this is the first character that is being read. After reading it, it is transferring that character to A n care. The current value of n care is 0 initially. So it will transfer the first character read to 0th element. After doing this operation, it will compare it with x. The first character is unlikely to be x, so it will be valid. Then it will also check, is n car less than 256? Yes, n car is 0 still. So n car will be less than 256. And after completely evaluating this total condition, it will give effect to n car plus plus. Please remember this post increment operation. Although I have said n car plus plus, n car is not updated immediately after that operation is done. It is n car is plus plus is effected only when that complete thing in which that plus plus appears is complete. So till that is completed, n car will continue to have a value 0. The moment that is completed, n car will now become 1. So there is no body in this, so it will repeat itself. This time a character that will be read will be read in a n care 1 because n care has changed now. Again the same thing will happen, n care will become 2 and so on. So you will notice that this loop does exactly what the previous loop did. But I get rid of the first initialization of get care for first character to kickstart this and I do not need a body because all the operations that I was doing in the body of the iteration I am doing in the while statement itself. This is very commonly used and you will come across this in any example that you read on character handling or for that matter array handling in many places. The rest of it is of course same. I just output the ASCII values. I have a single statement in the for loop so I just put it here. By using the for loop I can do it from 0 to 8. So this is clear how you handle this. Here is another way of doing it, except that it reads characters up to end of line. Because what I am doing here is, I am saying get S A directly. Notice that A is now declared as a char array. So get S A will get a string from the input and it will get a string including blanks, capital X, whatever, whatever, till enter is pressed. The moment you press and enter, a backslash 0 will be inserted. So the char array A will now contain a proper string terminated by backslash 0. How do you analyze any proper string? Standard, while A in char is not equal to 0, because when uh, not equal to backslash 0, that means null. So if you, till you find a null character, you have to keep doing it. And what you are doing is you are Continuing the loop, what you are doing is you are outputting C val equal to A n care plus plus. You see what we are doing? We are actually incrementing n care inside this index expression itself. But it will take effect after this entire statement is executed. So n care is initially 0. A 0's ASCII value will be captured in C val. That will be beco becoming the value of this expression that value will be printed, followed by a comma and a blank. And after that, n car will become 1. Again, you will execute this iteration and so on. This time, 
do you need to check for n care being less than 256? We are not checking that. The reason we are not checking that is we are guaranteed that the get s function would have inserted a backslash 0 when I read the string. That is the difference between get care and get s. Get s will actually read the string till you press enter and whatever is the string 20 characters, 25 characters before you press enter, instead of enter it will put a backslash 0 at the end. So, you are guaranteed that when you get the string back you would have a backslash 0. There is only one problem with get s, one of the reasons why it is called a deprecated function. It does not cross check for the array bound being violated. So, suppose I type 500 characters before I press enter, I am sunk. What get s will do very methodically is it will push 500 characters into that array. Of course, the array is declared to have only 256 elements, but it will logically go to the next location, next location, next location and keep stuffing characters. And in the last location, you put a backslash 0. So, it is possible that I may never encounter a backslash 0 and I will keep reading it. However, the way the program is written, it will work in most cases and if you have input 500 characters, you will actually get all 500 characters printed because array bound checking is your responsibility. And since the previous statement would have stuffed the characters in consecutive locations, you will get those many characters. Of course, in the process something else may get chewed up. For example, if n care itself happens to be a variable whose location is after array a, you do not know, then that n care will contain some funny arbitrary value initially. So, funny things may happen if you are not very careful. Let us do one more thing here. Suppose we are not comfortable with this function get s. Can you write get s yourself? Instead of this, I want to write some code which will get me a valid string in A by using get care. Can we do that? Yes, we can do that. What will I have to do? We know what get s does. It reads every character till it finds an enter symbol. Whenever it finds an enter symbol, it will put a backslash 0. How will I do that? I have already started with n care equal to 0. So, I will say, I will use the same logic that I did earlier, while c equal to get care. Okay? So, instead of c equal to get care, I will get care a itself. Suppose I wrote something like this. This will read a character in the array A, it will first read in 0th element, it will make n care equal to 1, subsequent execution will read it in the first element and so on. But this time I need to check something more which is agreed? backslash n is the enter symbol. So, this loop says while you have not entered enter, keep reading characters. Whenever you finish enter, you come out. When I come out here, the value of n care will be actually the number of characters in the array because it would have been incremented by 1 anyway at the end of this and the last character would have been backslash 0. However, does n care represent the length of the string? We have not put a backslash 0 inside that array yet. So, if I want to simulate get s, it is my responsibility to put a backslash 0 at the end. So, suppose I said a will this work? Yes, I say no. 
Okay, what was the last character that you read? The last character that you read was backslash n. At that value, at that time, n car had a value, let's say, 5. So the fifth element is backslash n. But you don't want backslash n in your array. That is not what get has done. Not only that, this 5 would have become 6 when you exit the loop. Because I have said n car plus plus. Remember, this statement I am executing outside the loop. After I come out of here. There is no body for the loop. So consequently, suppose I had read, I had typed India on my input. Okay. Oops, what happened? I had typed India as my input. This would go into which element? Zeroth element. This will go in first element. This will go in second element. This will go in third element. This will go in fourth element. Agreed? Now I would have entered a backslash n here. This would go into fifth element. And when I come out of this loop, my n care would be six because n care has been incremented. Where do I want to put a backslash zero? Here. So in the fifth position, I want to put a backslash zero. The fifth position currently has backslash n. So I should say n care minus. Now I have formed a balance. So anybody who on an Ubuntu or any machine has a problem with get s can simply write this and you will implement exactly the same. So are you comfortable how the in input is handled? The output is handled in the same way. In fact, I can actually print a character string A directly by C out. We have seen how that happens. If A contains a valid string which is terminated by backslash 0, then C out A would actually print that string up to backslash 0. C out is capable of recognizing backslash zero in a string and terminate out. Sorry, I should put this as like this. Forgot to put this bracket here. But anyway, now the first condition, observe that it's not really a condition. In fact, this particular A n care plus plus equal to get care is completely unlikely to be false ever. Because it's not really a condition, it's an operation. I am Cheating why? In the guise of a condition, I am actually asking it to do an operation. Technically, an operation can give a false result if it results in zero. Okay. If an expression value is zero, then that condition part will be false. That is the nature of the condition evaluation. Now, what happens when this statement is executed? I am actually getting a character at the input. Notice that I can type any character except zero. I can never type a zero, not zero symbol, but zero value. If I type zero, its ASCII code is what is being captured. And that will be assigned to this A n car. N car will be incremented only later. So this condition is never false. So all that I am doing is whether this condition is false. Yeah, that's right. N car will be incremented only when the entire thing is done. No, no, no. If the the n care is always incremented after completing the operation independent of what that operation is. Ah, his question was, if this condition happens to become false, that means I have entered actually backslash n, I will come out of this, how can n care be incremented? So the answer to this is, incrementing in n care is not optional depend on the what happens to the condition. The moment I have said n care plus plus, the C compiler will automatically introduce a forced instruction n care equal to n care plus 1 after that operation is completed independent of what the condition result is. So post increment operation is a very powerful fellow. He is not dependent on what happens to the expression. Whatever happens to the expression, it will be incremented. Good question. This point is to be remembered that post increment is forced. It will always happen. Here is another problem. I have listed, I have, I have typed in a series of names of my colleagues, Nanlal Sada, Moreshwar Pujade, Milin Soni, Ajit Diwan. All that I want is write a program which will separate out these names. So you can try this out in the context of the more general problem which I will discuss here. But this problem 
appear simple you can define a string called first name you can define a string called second name you can start assembling characters as you read them from input in the first name the moment you come across a blank you terminate that string by putting a backslash zero and then start assembling the second string and do the same thing when the second string ends very simple the problem happens if there are multiple blanks in between the problems would happen if there are blanks after the second part the problems could happen if there are blanks before the first part so you have to check whether your program works correctly for such situations or not i will leave it to you to write that program but this is the program that we'll briefly discuss for which i have given one sample solution in the handout so here is a more general problem i have typed in words i want to read this string and analyze this string identifying different words a word is any contiguous set of symbols non blank symbols that is word so if there is a blank it starts a different word this is a simple example how many words do i have here five words so hello world how are you this is a well formed sentence one blank in between but this is a sentence in which there are three blanks two blanks five blanks and there are blanks at the beginning and although you don't see it i have inserted some blanks at the end here when i type it the trailing blanks are most difficult to visibly verify you can't see them but in an actual practice you may get any anything that somebody types there how do you do this problem so first we do some analysis to figure out how will we actually read a string and store different words first of all typically this is my reasoning i will type a line which is physically one line of the terminal a, a monitor line has 80 characters is 80 columns so i will generally not type a line more than 80 columns that's my assumption so i can define a string so this is one char type that i will announce char line string by using getters i can read this string now in this string i have to identify different words what is the longest possible word all 80 characters just a single word what is the smallest possible word one character if i type one character blank one character blank one character blank i can get up to 40 words each of these potentially could be 80 characters long so the best bet for me to assemble these words is to declare an array char oh sorry so i have a two dimensional array two dimensional char array how many rows it has 40 rows because i don't expect more than 40 words to come across each word will be stored in the columns of that row and the last symbol in that row would be a backslash zero that is what i would get exactly of course i won't get backslash zeros when i type the string i'll simply get words blanks etc it is my job to assemble so effectively what i want to do is i want to read a string in line string then i want to start scanning from the first position whatever it is whenever i come across a non blank character i know the first word has started let us say this is my uh, two dimensional array so in word 0 i should start assembling the first non blank character that means all the initial blanks i should skip i should forget the blanks then what should i do then i should put this hello h here then this should be followed by e this should be followed by l l oh so i have, i have finished this after that the moment i notice a blank i know one word has terminated so i should before starting ahead i should put a backslash zero here and then increment this to one because now i know that i am adding a next word so can you see now how the iteration will work there has to be a single iteration which will cover from start to end the entire string within that iteration i have to keep 
removing blanks. The moment a blank comes, I have to terminate the present word and start the new word. The program that has been written here, I will just write the operative part. Do you remember the string length function? Get s will get me a valid string terminated by a backslash 0. When I use the library function string length, okay, strlen, it will actually do an internal scanning of that string, go up to backslash 0 and return the length of the string. So, n car is the length of the string. So, if I have typed 45 characters, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 44 would contain those characters. 45th position would contain a backslash 0, length of the string will be 40. All that I need to do now is, I set up an iteration for i equal to 0, i less than n char, I require only one iteration, it amounts to one scan of the entire string starting with 0th element up to backslash 0. Now remember, during this scan, I will somewhere, somewhere come across hello, somewhere world, somewhere how, somewhere are, somewhere you, etc. Okay. In this particular program version, I have assumed that I start with a non-blank character. So the first thing I check is whether a character is blank or not. If it is not blank, I have to assemble it in the current word. What is the current word start point? 0, 0. The variables which I have declared for that, j and k, the j is the row number, k is the column number for the word array. So, if you notice the next condition, it says, if If line string is not equal to blank, that means I have found a valid character, I must insert it in word. So, I now say word j, which is the jth word. Notice j starts with 0 anyway. I have to insert it into kth column. k was 0 initially, but immediately after insertion, I should add 1 to k. So, I put this k plus plus here. All that I am doing is, I am picking up the ith character from line string, which I have just confirmed it is not a blank, therefore it belongs to a word. I put that in the next location for the word that I am looking at right now. And I increment the character count of that word by incrementing k. I will do one more thing here, which says blank flag. Blank flag is 0. What does it mean? I am setting up a flag. If I encounter a blank, I will raise that flag to 1. If I do not encounter a blank, I will keep it as 0. But since I do not know what was the previous character, I will do this setting every time I look at a character. If that character is non-blank, which is what it was right now, then the flag must remain 0. So, I set it to 0. That is my convention. If I encounter a blank, I will set it to 1. This is all that I need to do in this loop if I find a non-blank character. Now, whatever else I require to do inside this loop will deal with the situation where I have come across a blank character or a sequence of blanks, etc. So, I have nothing to do with that if I have found a non-blank character. That is why I use the term continue here. This continue will automatically take me out of this for loop. So, whatever I do next will not apply. So, see how I am using the continue statement. I am jumping out of the loop, not out of the loop. 
आई एम जंपिंग फॉर द नेक्स्ट स्टेटमेंट कॉन्सिक्वेंटली वॉट दिस स्टेटमेंट सेट डज इज इफ इट फाइंड अ नॉन ब्लैंक कैरेक्टर इट पुट्स इट इन वर्ड एंड सिंपली गोज बैक टू द नेक्स्ट वैल्यू ऑफ आई बिकॉज कंटिन्यू स्टेटमेंट विल फोर्स इट टू द नेक्स्ट सिचुएशन एंड आई विल कंटिन्यू ट्रेवलिंग अराउंड टिल आई कम अक्रॉस द फर्स्ट ब्लैंक सपोज आई से हेलो फॉलोड बाय फर्स्ट ब्लैंक आई गेट आई विल डू दिस टिल बट आई विल नॉट एग्जीक्यूट दिस इफ स्टेटमेंट सो दैट मीन्स इफ द कैरेक्टर इज नॉन ब्लैंक आई वुड हैव कम हियर now when i come here there are two possibilities either i have finished the string in which case this was the last word i get out okay or i have found a blank character if there is a blank character what am i supposed to do i will set the blank flag that is one and i will keep skipping those blanks however when a non blank character comes i will have to start assembling a new word but have i ended the word remember i was so far assembling the zeroth word i have put h e l l o and i am waiting for the next character there so the first blank that i find when i come here if i have found the first blank what must i do i must go to word zero put a backslash zero in that position and then increment j so that i start assembling a new word next time this is what this program does i would request you to look at this program carefully back home try to hand execute it for hello world or some two or three words like this and make sure that it works in all cases there is at least one case in which this program does not work i would like you to find out that case and i would like you to find out what should you do to the program such that it works correct it's a very small thing that you can do but you will have to think about it under what circumstances this program will not work so you may try the same string hello world how are you or whatever just two words three words whatever and try separate combinations more blanks here some blanks here some blanks at the end some blanks at the beginning and figure out what happens is that okay so you'll be able to answer this fine next we come to revisiting the memory locations we'll consider the notion of a pointer that is available in c c++ so ordinarily we know that memory is organized in bytes byte is too small a value to handle larger numbers so we have for example 2 byte 4 byte or 8 byte locations depending upon whether we say short int long double float whatever okay so consider let us say the variables and arrays that i have declared here int m float a3 char c4 this declares a single variable m how many bytes it will have four bytes integer in ubuntu is four bytes float a3 how many bytes totally this array will have three elements four bytes each four into 3 12 bytes char c4 is four element array how many bytes it will have only 4 because char occupies only one byte so char is allocated one byte these are some sample values that i have shown here some arbitrary assignments i have done m is equal to 573 sorry there is a there is a semicolon missing at the end what is the objective of writing all of this what we want to see is how exactly the c++ compiler is likely to allocate memory to these variables what would be the addresses and what would be the value stored in those variables so we see what we may call a memory map a possible memory map certain assumptions we are making the assumption that we have made here is that all the locations allocated are in the same sequential order in which i have declared those names that assumption is not right by the way we shall soon see that c++ can merely choose to put one variable here another variable there one array there etc etc what a compiler guarantees however is that if an array is allocated space 
then various elements of the array will necessarily be allocated consecutive locations. So if A0 starts at some point, A1 will necessarily start at next point after allocating as many bytes as are required for A0. Here is an example. We assume that M is allocated at address 10,000. This is a sample value. Number of bytes needed are 4. A array is allocated next. A0 will be allocated the byte address 10,004. This will require 4 bytes. So A1 will be allocated 1,008. There is no confusion there. 4 bytes, 4 bytes, 4 bytes for A0, A1, A2. Immediately followed by this, suppose array C has been allocated and let's say C0 is address 1016. It contains, let's say, the character U. C1 will be 1017. Why? Because characters require only one byte. So you are comfortable with this mapping? Now, ordinarily in our program, we refer to these values by these names. M is equal to 573. C out M. P is equal to M. So whenever we say M, we mean this value. We do not have to deal with these addresses at all. But can we? And should we? Is a question. Should we deal with addresses directly? The current pedagogical answer is no. You should not deal with addresses directly. Can we deal with the addresses directly? The answer is yes. Because... People who write compilers, people who write operating systems, have to deal with these memory address locations because the actual memory locations are to be participating in any instruction execution. So surely software can access those things. Whether that access should be made available at a higher level like C++, the designers of language C and C++ said yes, it is required. It is required because adequate abstraction capabilities did not exist in the early programming language. So the very first programming language, Fortran, for example, had nothing to do with addresses. It would work strictly at the higher level with the names. But the language C and therefore the language C++ provided for point. The address handling is done through a special variable type called pointer type. This pointer type is completely different from integer, float, etc., etc. We shall see that notion. So these addresses are essentially pointers to memory locations. Notice that each points to a location containing value to a specific type. For example, 10,000 is a pointer to M. It is pointing to an integer type value. 10,012 is pointing to a floating point value. I would like you to ponder about this distinction. Both 10,000 and 10,012 are addresses. 10,000, 10,001, 10,000, each one is address. In absolute terms, it is a numerical value because addresses start in any memory from zero and go up to millions or billions depending upon whether you have megabytes or gigabytes of memory. So as such, in the address value, there is no distinction. All addresses are same. However, inside a programming language, you want to remember that this address points to a specific type of value. One address points to an integer type value. Another address points to a floating point type of value. If you don't remember this and try to manipulate addresses and their contents directly, you may land up in soup if you don't remember what the value is. And therefore, the pointer notion which C, C++ defines, as we shall see in a moment, is always associated with a specific type. What it means is, yes, we can deal with addresses directly, but we cannot deal with addresses in absolutely indiscreet fashion. Every address must come tagged with a type of value that it points to. And it is that type that will make, that will permit us, that will not permit us to mix addresses of different types. We shall see that in a moment. So as I have said here, ordinarily we don't deal with these pointers or addresses. We use names and arrays. But C++ permits pointers. And a pointer is a special type where a location address can be found and stored in that pointer type name. And we can also con use the pointer to identify the contents of that pointer. So here is an example. Such a location M. So this is the location M. What are the contents of M? 
573. What is the address of M? 10,000. Now suppose I had a pointer P. This is a new element. This is a new animal. It does not exist so far in our program. And suppose I manage to extract the address of M, which is 10,000, and put it inside. Then what do I have? I have a location which contains the address. How do I get this address in P? Having got this address in P, can I access 573 using P? So P is a pointer. Two questions we are asking. First, how do we get inside P an address of a location? Second, having got this address at 10,000, is there a mechanism for me to say, I want to go to contents pointed to by this address 1000. So what will be the address here? 10,016, what are the contents of 10,016? In short, I want to do two operations. If ever I am permitted to have such pointer variables, one operation, get a valid address of some location into a pointer. Second operation, access the contents of that location using address which is stored in the point. Both these operations are permitted and they are executed in this fashion. So this is first of all the definition of a pointer. C++ defines a special type called pointer type. And this pointer type is defined by using int star p. Int star p. Now that's a very funny convention. How do you remember star so far? Star is a multiplication. So p star q, m star n is multiple. That is when it appears in an expression already. But star has multiple avatars. In C++, in the definition, if I say int star p, it means p is not of the type int, but p is a pointer which will contain an address which will point to an integer type value. So pointer is tagged to a type. Can I declare a floating point uh, uh, a pointer? Any clue on how will I declare a float, floating point pointer? Is it necessary to write star along with P1? Can I write float star blank 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 P1? Any answer? The question I am making is, can I say will it make any difference? You should immediately so say that it will never make a difference. You have forgotten one statement I had made long time ago. The first thing that a C compiler does, C++ compiler does, is that it removes all white spaces from your program. All blanks, all tab characters are all removed from your program before compiler analyzes it. So therefore, float blank 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 star P1, float star blank 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 P1 is one and the same. There is no difference whatsoever. If you write float P1, it would mean a name P1 which actually holds a floating point. If you say float star P1, then P1 is a pointer object, it is a separate fellow. And P1 can at some time eventually contain an address which will point to a floating point value. That is the meaning of it. Okay. So this particular int star p defines a name p to have a type int star. So now we are introducing a new type. In fact, we are introducing multiple new types. We already know what types, int, float, double, char, etc. Now we know we can have int star, float star, char star, double star. So we can have pointers which will point to contents of a specific type. 
how do we get a value for p you remember in the previous slide we showed that if m was an integer and i had this 10000 here i could actually in pointer p have the value the 10000 which is the address how do i extract the value of the address can i for example say p equal to 112000 some arbitrary integer i know it's an integer value internal can i do that well actually i can the c++ will not object but extremely funny results may happen because this 112000 has come out of your mind suppose you run your program today and we shall as we shall see we can actually print the pointer values after extracting the right values and you note that your variable m was at this location tomorrow can you directly assign this address the answer is no because tomorrow when you run the program the actual memory locations may be different please note how are actual memory locations assigned to your variable when you execute your program so i'm digressing but it's important to note the following whenever i say dot slash a dot out that is the point when my translated program is going to be loaded in the memory and then is going to be executed now at that time the operating system will give my program a chunk of memory and say please accommodate yourself here i know exactly how much total memory you will require this a dot out program when it is loaded at that time the loader will assign okay you were m here today you go to location 1012 okay but suppose the memory locations assigned by the operating system are different every time that you run your program because operating system is doing variety of other things so you can never be sure as to what is the absolute value of an address till your program is loaded there and only when your program execution begins then you can find what is the address and therefore you must have a mechanism to dynamically find out the address of a location and therefore you require some special operations which are indicated here these are the two operations that you can perform related to pointers the first operation is called the address operator and you use the symbol and for that so and followed by any name will return the address of that name there is a dereferencing operator which you may say the reverse of address given an address it will find out the contents and that dereferencing operation is again star so star is overused very heavily one for multiplication other for defining a pointer and this is the third one now which is actually used in any statement that you write in your c++ program so for example and m will mean address of m any time in an expression you write and m you will get an address can i assign it to an integer variable x i can but it doesn't make sense i should assign it to a pointer in fact this is the only way for any pointer in your program to get a proper value so you do and something the address of that something will be returned which you can store in a point that's why it's called a address operator or referencing operator the opposite operator is star if p is a pointer and if you say star p it means contents of address stored in p so if p contains 1000 then the location 1000 whatever it contains those contents are referred to by star p and remember those contents are known already to be either integer or float or char depending upon the type of point that is how you define the pointer type so p must be declared as a pointer and it should be assigned a value through the address operator that is the right way of doing it is that understood let us look at some examples to clarify this i have declared int m and n and then i have declared int star p m and n are normal locations p is a pointer m is equal to 25 again a semicolon is missing you can add it there p is equal to and m this is a valid operation what will it give the address of m whatever be the address 10000 20000 whatever it will come and sit in p now if i write an expression n is equal to star p plus 3 this is a valid expression 3 means value 3 okay 
If I had used x y, it would have meant value x. But when I say star p, it does not mean value of p. It means the value pointed to by p. So star p is a dereferencing of. <coughs> Consequently, since p was assigned the address of m, and since m contained 25, star p means 25, and 25 plus 3 is 28. So this will work correctly. So is this concept clear? This is a consolidation of whatever we discussed. We can declare pointer variables in our programs, such as int star p1, float star p2, char star p3, etc. Above declaration will allocate locations for the three pointers. Each pointer location can contain an address. Now the addresses could be 32 bits or 64 bits, depending upon the nature of the operating system and the computer that you have. If you have Computers which have which are 64 bit computers. That means address can be 64 bit long. So you can have many more than gigabytes and terabytes of memory inside you. Then the pointer which will be assigned in that environment will have a 64 bit location. Ordinarily, it's a 32 bit location. 32 bit addresses are good enough. How many bytes you can access using a 32 bit address? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 2 to the power 32 minus 1. It's a fairly large number. Now suppose we write p1 equal to and m, then if I say int q q equal to star p1, we'll assign to q 573 if m has the value 573 as we just saw. We can print a value pointed to by simply writing c out star p1. In fact, there is no difference between writing star p1 or m or x. Star p1 is as good as any other value. It is of course our responsibility to ensure. That P1 has been assigned an appropriate address before I come to this point. Now this is something special. I can also print the value of pointer itself. I can say C out less less P1. So at any given instance, I can actually find out inside operating system as uh, given which particular address to my location. These addresses are printed in hexadecimal form. Remember, we have said zero x. If anything begins with zero x. It means the number is hexadecimal. Hexadecimal means zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, A, B, C, D, E, F. These are the sixteen symbols. So this is how it will be printed. We can also increment the value of a pointer. Now we come to pointer arithmetic, and this is what makes it interesting. Suppose I say P two is equal to and A zero. What will this do? It will put the address of A zero. The zeroth element of an array A into pointer P2. Now I say P2 plus plus. When I say P2 plus plus, ordinarily plus plus means add one. But P2 plus plus or P2 is equal to P2 plus one has a different interpretation in C plus plus. I am playing with pointers. The objective is I should point to the next location of that type. Now if A zero is Four byte location, a integer or float. Then I know that a one, the next location, will be four bytes away, and therefore C plus will add not one but four bytes. Consequently, after adding one to P two like this, if I say C out star P two, I will get the contents of location a one. Is this is this understood? This is an important notion. So let us say this was a zero. Now a zero will have one, two, three, four bytes. Then this will be a one. This will have one, two, three, four bytes. Then this will be a two. Now suppose I have said this is my P2, and let us say P2 contains 10,000 because this address was 10,000. Now when I say P2 is equal to P2 plus one, I would ordinary arithmetic sense I would expect 10,000 to become 10,001, but C++ remembers that P2 is a pointer. And whenever I increment it by one, 
it will increment this pointer which is currently pointing here to point to the next loop because it will know it is pointing to an integer type and therefore it has to add 4 bytes to it. Consequently now P2 will become 10,004. If I do once again P2++, what will it point to? This fact can be utilized effectively to access consecutive array elements by simply using pointers. So I can capture some pointer P is equal to add A0. And now I can keep doing P++ and a star operation. Star P++ will actually consecutively next element of array A is what it will be pointing. We shall see more examples of the pointers later. I will conclude this lecture by just showing you what happens when you execute some programs. Here is a pointer example program. I have declared variables m and n and an array a. I have given some value to m and n. This particular example is about just two variables m and n. I have declared two pointers, star ptr1, star ptr2, both are of type int. I get the values of m and n printed, which are 573 and minus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Then I say, and m is assigned to ptr1. So I am getting the address of m and putting it this. Since I have said m followed by n in my declaration, somehow in my mind I expect that m and n will be allocated consecutive locations. M will have 4 bytes, N will have next 4 bytes. So I do an arbitrary thing. I say pointer 2 is equal to pointer 1 plus 1. Okay. And now I say the pointer values are these and the corresponding data values are star ptr1, star ptr. What do I expect? I again expect to get the value of M and value of N printed here. In the process, I will also get the value of addresses. This is the output. M and N are printed to be like this. These are the pointer values. However, the corresponding data values are 573 and minus 1077217072. What has happened? What has happened is that this pointer was correctly pointing to M because I explicitly said PTR1 equal to and M. But then I added four to I added one to that pointer, which incremented that pointer value by four. So I have here AC and B0. B0 is correct 4 bytes away. But unfortunately that does not happen to be the location allocated to N. Because operating system said you might have declared M followed by N. But I choose to put M here, I choose to put N there. And that is the reason why you are getting a funny value. The correct program is to say PTR1 equal to AND M. PTR2 equal to AND M. And then if I print the pointer values, I will see what actually the addresses are allocated and let us see whether I get the correct, of course I will get the correct value. When I say star PTR1, I know I am pointing to the value of M. When I say star PTR2, I know I am addressing the value of N because I had explicitly assigned. This happens to be the result. Notice that the pointers have these values. 0x BFB 2772C 0x BFB 27728. 28 is before 2C. So the compiler has chosen to allocate N first followed by M. That is compiler's decision, it's not under my control. Moral of the story is that you should always get explicit addresses captured through the AND pointer and use them. However, one thing C guarantees, which is if I have an array declared, whatever is the base address of the array is not under my control. That the compiler will assign anywhere. But once it assigns a base address, compiler guarantees that all subsequent elements of that array will be given consecutive locations. Which means my pointer arithmetic can work there and I can access various elements of that array using merely the pointers. So we will stop here. Just remember that there is a plethora of examples in any book on C++ or for that matter on C which will tell you how to handle character arrays, uh, 
floating point arrays, matrices, etc. using pointers. We will see some examples in the subsequent classes.